Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Operator Syndrome. I'm Patrick and here with Steve. Uh, we're going to get into the main topic now for, for the next few episodes, uh, which is talking about our, our individual stories uh, that led us to special operations, but compare them against each other. Uh, if you've watched previous episodes, uh, I served in the, in, in the Ranger Battalions and uh, Steve served in the, in the Navy SEALs, the lauded Navy SEALs, which is what probably brought you to this YouTube channel in the first place. So let's start off with, with asking Steve um, what in his background and his childhood uh, and, and him uh, growing up led him to military service. So, so Steve, why don't you kick us off? All right. Um, the earliest, well, I, I guess I, the earliest I can remember uh, thinking along the lines of uh, going into some sort of a an aggressive military type of career it was on the playground in kindergarten uh, where I met my at that time best friend you know I have your best friend growing up <clears throat> his name is Donald and um, we were on the playground and this was back in the day where teachers just let you go like a bunch of wild savages right and they would go inside and have their smoke break and hopefully everything worked out well things worked out on the playground all right and um, there was this new kid named William. I don't even remember his last name. But I'll, I'll never forget his face. He had really curly hair. And this is the 70s, early 70s. So <laughs> he had a fro kind of. He was the white kid. But anyway, he, um, the, the, all, I looked up and he was down by this tree. And all of the other kids in kindergarten, all of the other male kids in kindergarten were ganging up on him. They were going to beat him up. I don't know what the poor kid did. Probably nothing. And I just remember this wild, crazy look in his eyes, like a fear, uh, rightly so. And I thought, man, I don't like bullies. I've never liked bullies. And um, I'm like, I'm not going to stand by and, and see this happen. So I just took off running to his side. And there were more of them than us. And I was like, I'm going to go down swinging because you're not going to bully this kid if I can help it. Well, the next thing you know, and I took off my belt, <laughs> I was wearing a belt, took it off. And I was like, all right, let's party, <laughs> you know, and I, I just knew I didn't have much to defend us with. You had to even the odds. I had to even the odds. Right. And uh, at that time, this other guy who was kind of new to Donald, I guess we were all new as kindergarten. Heck. Right. But uh, he looked over and thought those that guy looks intense <laughs> at meeting me. And he said, I'm going to be on their side. So he comes over. And the next thing you know, it was like the other guys are starting to go, this is looking like too much trouble. Uh, and they just dissipated. They just walked away from it. Um, and then Donald and I ended up becoming complete best friends. And I come from a, about as middle class of family as you could. Both my parents are college educated. My father is a research chemist. My mother is a school teacher. Um, um, Donald's father was an attorney. Uh, prominent attorney in Kentucky. Um, and um, we just fell, we just became best friends. And, and that involved getting in trouble, lighting things on fire, building forts in the woods, blowing things up. Yes, my own dear dad taught us how to build a bomb. Nice. <laughs> he's, I mean, he's a chemist, you know, and um, right. we, we rebuilt bombs and stuff like that. So anyway, we, we loved military role playing, like a lot of millions of boys uh, and girls um, through, throughout time. And we always wanted to do something cool. And back then, we'd heard of the Green Berets, of course, John Wayne and um, uh, all of that. We'd heard of Army Rangers. We had heard of 82nd Airborne. To us, that they were elite. And they you could make a case that 82nd is, is elite on a, on a certain level. Um, sure. It's, it's all kind of compared to what... But um, yeah, so and Marines, Force Recon, that was another one. So every time we went out, we'd go on these faux missions. We even bought, we saved our money and bought a rubber raft and, and floated down Harrods Creek in Oldham County, Kentucky, if anybody knows where in the heck that is, um, pretending we were on the Mekong Delta in Vietnam going to get to, to liberate somebody or strike a target or whatever. So um, one day, Donald... Donald's father kind of wisely 
never allowed a TV in their home, but they had a library. And uh, he said, you read, you, you read, you can get a TV when you get off on your own. Um, he, and it was kind of look back on it. That was kind of a, an interesting approach. So we did. And we, he had books on Vietnam and his father was a Marine. He didn't serve abroad, but he was a Marine and he could tell us Marine stories. And one time he said, yeah, the, the talk back then was uh, about these guys named Navy SEAL or called Navy SEALs. And we were like, what's that? And, you know, we never even heard the word. And he goes, well, they were really tough. And we're like, Navy guys, tough? thought they just swabbed decks on ships and stuff like that. Right. So we finally found a book on, on frogmen, World War II frogmen. This is, the SEALs came from the frogmen of World War II, which were underwater demolition teams that swam in and planted bombs to blow up man-made and natural obstacles for landing craft, for Marines mostly and other army landing craft to come in in an invasion and they would swim in in the dark hours just really pretty risky stuff by themselves with a k-bar knife and you know a mask right. and fins i mean it was pretty pretty crude but they were pretty tough guys and um in 1962 john f kennedy founded the special forces the army special forces a la the green berets and the Navy SEAL teams. And so the SEAL teams recruited guys out of the UDT teams. So those were underwater demolition teams. And then they had the SEAL teams and they weren't the same. Everybody, Jesse, the body, everybody says he was a SEAL. He was a UDT. Technically he wasn't a SEAL team, but um, I mean, nobody really cares, but he, he was actually UDT, but anyhow, so we, 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 I, we became fascinated. I saw a picture of a seal in Vietnam with tiger striped camis on, mm -hmm. blue jeans, a goatee mustache coming way down, a, a, like a bandana around his head, and, and a stoner machine gun, an old, made by Cadillac Gage. It, it, was, a, it was a belt fed with a, with a magazine on it. It was really funky looking. And I just thought it was the coolest thing. I was just mesmerized just looking at this guy and thinking, man, he doesn't fit any kind of the traditional molds. Um, the he's, uniforms all mix matched and all this. So from then on, I I, I kind of thought those were my heroes. Um, so went to high school, played football, wrestled. Very at Louisville, Kentucky, very suburban, white, privileged kind of upbringing. Um, but uh, got to college and um, I hated it. I was too restless. I was rambunctious. I wanted to see the world. I wanted to, as I say, chop them up, shoot them up. And um, I was too bored in, in class. And I, my best friend was, well, <laughs> Donald had gone a different direction in life. He, he just, uh, d just didn't follow that path. Um, and uh, one of my friends was a narcotics detective in Louisville, Kentucky. When I turned 18, I could actually sign a waiver back in the Wild West and ride along with him on drug bust. And I thought that was cool because I wanted to be a, a narcotics detective or an undercover cop. So mm -hmm. I thought that would be cool, but I couldn't do that till I was 21. So what do I do? I'm 18 and I'm, I'm, I'm at University of Louisville and I'm realizing I'm wasting my father's money and I, he doesn't deserve that. And uh, it's pointless. Didn't want to go to class, made straight C's. <laughs> nice. Anyway, I got a paper one day in my apartment in downtown Louisville, and it, it was the Courier Journal, the Louisville paper, and it said, Reag, new Reagan initiative programs, President Reagan, called Dive Fair Seeks Seals. And I'd re I just immediately just started reading this article, and it was a program where, because they wanted to, Reagan, he was kind of a visionary in some ways, because he thought that the wars of the future were going to be trending toward unconventional warfare, which... And they did um, in a big way. And so he wanted to double the number of SEALs. Um, so they just wanted to get more bodies going through the pipeline to be SEALs. So if the, the deal was, if you signed, uh, you go to the recruiter, signed up for the Navy, if you've passed a psychological screening, a physical screening, and that was it. Oh, and, and the ASFAB, you had to have a qualifying ASFAB score. Right. If you did those three things, then they would guarantee in writing you at least got to go to BUDS, which is the basic underwater demolition seal boot camp. Now, there's no guarantee you're going to make it, but they would guarantee you would, you would go there. And so um, it was Christmas Eve at my grandparents' house. And I dropped this bomb on everybody. And uh, dad was not happy. It, 
he, I said, dad, I'm dropping out of college. I'm going to join the Navy and be a SEAL. And he looked at me like I had lobsters coming out of my ears. Like he was, he was, he was kind of half heartbroken and half thought I'd lost my marbles. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I think you're just making a horrible mistake. You know, I, you should go to college. I mean, he was like, said something like you can get killed doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> I was like, well, that's the whole point. But, um, so yeah. So in March of 1900, in the year of our Lord, 1987, I, uh, went to in march i went to boot camp uh, to navy boot camp which is the first step you got to go learn how to be a sailor and then you got to go to another school called an a school to learn how to do a, a military job because with an 80 percent attrition rate it's more effective to train you to do the job you're going to do once you quit than <laughs> right. to train you this way and then go to an a school so um we'll save that those stories for when we have time and um, I'll kick it over to Patrick. Um, I'm interested to know, you know, in your background, so you, you grew up in uh, suburban Louisville, right? Is that, what, yeah. is that an accurate description? That's Would you correct. say that, you know, a lot of people have an idea of the type of person that would go into the SEAL teams, right? So, you know, were, were you, would you say that you were the, the an avid outdoorsman, hunter, shooter, fisher, hiker, backpacker, something like that? Would you say you fit that mold? Yeah, pretty much. Um, to the degree, yeah, I would say from a, from a stereotypical standpoint, yeah. But, but I, what I've learned is seals could come from so many different walks of life. Mm -hmm. I mean, surfers from California to hunters and outdoorsmen to kind of geeky nerd types it's really a mixed bag it's not what you would think necessarily and especially making it through training and we can get to that later but yeah i was um i would I, I like i never really liked to hunt but i was good at it but I, this just came naturally my dad took me rabbit hunting one time and i was like in middle school i think and because that's just what you did in red-blooded america um and I, I really never did like it. I like to shoot guns, but I didn't like to shoot animals particularly. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my thing. But uh, dad took me out on my first rabbit hunt with I had a 12 gauge shotgun. And um, this rabbit takes off running full value across. And I just went pop and nailed it. And dad was like, holy crap, that's the best shot I've ever seen. You Maybe uh, you might be a good shot one day. So stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Would you, what kind of jobs did you, did you, did you work much? I mean, what kind of jobs had you held before, before you went into the military? For sure. Well, that's a really good, I probably left that out. It might've been the most important thing I ever did. Um, I, I wanted a pickup truck or a, a car. My dad bought me this for 600 whopping dollars. He bought me this orange beat up F 100 with a crappy three on the tree stick shift on it. And um, he said, here's your truck. Now you get a job and pay for the gas and the insurance. And I was like, okay. So we had a friend who had a concrete business, a precast concrete business where you pour parking bumpers and stepping stones. And literally my job was to push a wheelbarrow up and down a hill so that the, the other guy could scoop, scoop it out in buckets and pour it in these molds. And so, I mean, these were heavy oversized wheelbarrows. And he, 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 the guy could not keep help coming back because people would just quit. It was, it was hard work. I mean, mm -hmm. it's sweaty and hot and I would do it all summer. And, um, I just kept coming back and I just never, I quit. I stopped quitting the job. Wasn't an option to me. It didn't enter my mind. And my back, my lat muscles got huge from pushing these <laughs> wheelbarrows. Um, but, um, you know, it was brutal and he would work us he was a worker a farmer but mm -hmm. also a, a worker at this concrete factory and there were many days where he had to put up hay at night we'd be working from eight o'clock in the morning till quitting time four or five or whatever and he'd say all right everybody grab some water we got to go throw hay till dark and we we're like oh, okay boss says so and his wife would be driving this big old truck with a, a big old tub of kentucky fried chicken that we'd nice. smack down and then we'd throw hay till, till even after dark sometimes so that that work ethic i look back on it and man that had to have contributed to my tenacity and not wanting to quit and just 
not having a soft real job and it you know on my dad's side it was one of the best things he ever taught me is you want something okay go out and you work your butt and get it um so i really treasure those memories you you mentioned playing football did mm -hmm. you swim at all were you, were you much of a no. swimmer i mean kentucky i mean there are no oceans there you mentioned no. some rivers or anything so not much of a swimmer I love being in the water, but I hated swimming and I sucked at it. I, mm. I'm negative in the water naturally, okay. negatively. And, and so all my effort is to stay afloat. Yeah. So I'm not going to be ever be an Olympic swimmer. And I was one of the slow, I was in the slower third of my buds class in swimming. Okay. Well, you got to make it up in other ways, right? Yeah, you do. <laughs> so, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so 1987 is when you went in. Uh, 86 is when I was born. Okay, the end. Of, <laughs> the end of 86. You were still a twinkle in your mama's eye. That's right. This is a multi generational podcast here, everyone. We got something for everyone. So yeah. 86. I'm a millennial. I, I listen to your story, and I and I hear and I'm I I hear how I'm going to be exposed for very much the millennial that I am here. But uh, so, so my background, um, my father was an army officer. Uh, I had uh, a family history that was total, total military. Basically, everyone had been in the military. Uncles, great uncles, grandfather, everybody um, on my father's side. Uh, my father had met my mother when he was stationed in Korea. And I, I, am, one, I am the output of uh, a soldier going to Korea and picking up a Korean wife. So my brother and I, so, uh, the, the, I knew the army was all I knew as a child growing up army brat moving around constantly living in Georgia, Louisiana, Alabama, Kansas, Germany, all over the place. Um, you know, I was one, uh, my father and my mother separated and we became a blended family. Uh, so I, I grew up most of the time with uh, four brothers. So that was kind of the family dynamic. So four rascals or five rascals, sort of the same age, beating each other up, getting into trouble. I mean, that, <laughs> that, that was so that was going to I would be well suited to, to, to being in an infantry company and a ranger company later on, because that's the same dynamic. And the maturity level is about the same, to be quite <laughs> honest. So um, growing up, I. I only knew the military, and that's all I ever wanted to do. Um, my father was uh, uh, negative points for him, but he was an MP officer. So, you know, but, but I, I always thought what he did was cool, and he was gone a lot. So um, he, he'd served in, uh, he, he got into the Army, uh, man, at the end of the 70s, I think, or right at the beginning of the, I'm pretty sure the end of the 70s, enlisted first. Uh, as an enlisted MP, uh, MP guy, and then uh, went to college, then came back in as an MP officer. Um, uh, he did uh, the Desert Storm thing. He did, uh, you know, they all, the, the Army back then even did these really long training deployments. You know, I remember Bright Star. Oh, yeah. An exercise called Bright Star in Egypt. And he'd Egypt, be gone yeah. for what seemed to me like forever. I, I don't yeah. know how long he was gone. Definitely months, but he'd be time. gone forever. He was gone very often. And, um, and uh, he did uh, Kosovo, he did Bosnia, he did all that stuff. So all the stuff in that time frame, he, he was always there. He always seemed to get into it. Um, so growing up with five brothers, um, you know, didn't really, didn't really do that much in the way of sports. You know, my father was an army officer. He made okay money, but him being gone all the time and moving around all the time and having five kids, like everything you bought, you had to buy times five, you know food if you're going to play sports and that too so sports were never really a priority in our household we just kind of burned off our energy the old-fashioned way just beating each other up running around <laughs> playing in the neighborhood that type of stuff so nothing in the way of organized sports uh, but you know the, the big thing well so I, i'd mentioned this previously but um you know film and gaming was a big influence you know it so first and foremost is the family history of my father, but then, you know, just consuming movies and playing video games about the military, watching TV shows, um, the history channel back when I was a teenager, you know, so this would have been, you know, the early, the early aughts, 2000s, you know, back then they actually showed history, 
you know it was almost it was almost like the world war ii channel that's all it was it's just constantly yeah. black and white thing and i love that i always loved history and uh so I, i'd watch that and i'd hear about the exploits of you know the rangers back in world war ii you know and, and uh and playing video games call of duty right the first versions of call of duty yeah. that was all world war ii right and you were a paratrooper you were a ranger you know and, and those type of things and movies around that time when i was coming up black hawk down saving private ryan right so all these all these historical historically related movies that tied in with the military and i just bought into it I was just all about it. I always knew I was going to go into the military. I thought I wanted to fly or, or I think many folks would love to fly. Um, but I wore, I had glasses when I was yeah. growing up and then I, I, I bought into everyone back then was like, if you have glasses, you can't fly. And that might've been true at the time, but um, I don't think that's as much of a, as, uh, of a disqualifier as it is nowadays because you got LASIK. But so I, I resigned myself to, okay, I'm not going to be able to fly. So what else am I going to do? And always came back to to um, to to serving in the army in some capacity. Um, 9/11. I was a freshman in high school when 9/11 happened. Wow. I was in a public. It was morning. I was in a public safety class. Uh, ironically, <laughs> I was in a public safety class. And oh, just uh, paradox. Yeah. And uh, I remember uh, it, it was strange. It, it, the class was. Uh, a bunch of different grades, but it was an elective. Not, not ever, nobody really cared to be in there. And I was, I was kind of a quiet reserve dude. And I, I sat in my spot and I did my work and that was pretty much how, how, how I was. I remember the, 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 the teacher saying, Hey, Hey, Patrick, come up here. And he was looking at his computer screen. He was like, uh, a plane flew into the Pentagon or uh, a plane flew into the twin towers. And I didn't even know what the twin towers what were at the time. And I saw a picture, the very first picture I saw was of the side of a building and you couldn't see the edges but you could see like a black scar across it so you, you didn't have the reference to see what size it was and i i had assumed like many people who just saw pictures initially that it was like some small plane crashed into yeah. some big building apparently in new york well we spent the rest of the day um we spent the rest of the day basically in all our classes watching watching the footage of what happened um they didn't cancel school we were we were there all day um, and then I, we, this was in, uh, the suburbs of Atlanta at the time where, where I was going to high school that freshman year. And like, we had football practice <laughs> that, that <laughs> afternoon too, you know, and the coaches are like, Hey, Hey, y'all better get ready. You're going to get drafted for whatever this thing is. <laughs> so, so nine 11 was obviously for me huge, you know, like I, I was going to go into the military anyways, but, but when I watched that. I, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm definitely doing it. My father was on the tail end of his career and he actually deployed weeks later. He, he, he deployed to, um, I can't remember where it is, but there was a staging bay. I think it might've been Uzbekistan or somewhere like that. Um, he was an MP and, and he had an expertise in force protection. So force protection is just how you know, military installations prep themselves to to to, to defend themselves, uh, but also security in general. So that, that was his expertise. And he went over to to Uzbekistan at the time. And when he came back, one of the stories he told me was about how, you know, and one of the few stories he told me was about how, you know, he, he was there and he was setting things up and he remembers a plane landing. And like all these guys getting off with all kinds, he's, his words were, they had all this cool shit hanging off of them, right? And he's talking about like nods and like weapons with, you know, he, he's an MP in, in 2001. Like, right. I think he just had a, a Beretta pistol, probably. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's it. Uh, but if he had a rifle, probably rocking iron sights. Mm, um, and then right. the, he, he talked and he was like, and those were the Rangers. And this was like one of those times, right? So you got a father, you got a father who you hold in high regard. And then when, when that father speaks highly of someone else, that grabs your attention. And so, yeah. so kind of all that planted the seed, uh, you know, in me to, to, to go and join and, and, and specifically the Rangers. So, um, yeah, so I went to, ooh, and we got to talk about, we'll talk about basic training the next time, but I got to hear your recruiter stories. So, um, <laughs> so I went in, I, you know, at the, and at the time, so that was 2001. I didn't graduate high school until 2005. So I spent 
you know, three more years watching everything play out. First Afghanistan, right? Um, and, the, and then see Iraq kick off and definitely feeling like the angst of feeling like I was going to miss out because I knew I was going to go into the military and, and all the action was happening then. And thanks to your, you and your ilk, like who had, who had really quickly won a war the last time, no one was quite sure how long this thing would last. Right. So, um, you know, I, I'd be in high school, I'd be in high school and the nightly news at night. I, do you remember this? This is kind of crazy to think about, but the nightly news at the end of the broadcast, they'd show the pictures of the people who died that day, the service members who died, you know, at first mm-hmm. it was like ones and twosies, but there were days when there would be like, you know, 10, 20 pictures of service members who, who passed away that day or the day prior on the nightly news, new faces right. every day. Right. I mean, it was intense and, yeah. and being young and dumb and, and having all those visions, those visions of, of glory from, from the history that I consumed and the movies and the, and the gaming and the other media, like I, I wanted to get into it. I, it didn't scare me. I was like, yeah. I got to go see what this is about. So um, I went into the recruiter's office and, oh man, yeah, we're, I'm going to say, I got some really good story. And I, you, you, everyone always has good, but I'll just talk about just the recruiting piece. So I go in there and you talked about it, like, uh, you know, uh, to join the Rangers there, they have special contracts that, that guarantee you a shot at, at the time RIP, which it, what is now RASP, it's called option 40. So you'd be an 11 Bravo, which is a basic infantryman, but it'd actually be 11 X-ray x-ray meaning that it wasn't quite decided what you would do um, because there's a, a regular infantryman and then there's a mortarman so 11 charlie so it's up in the air which one you're going to be but option 40 meant you get a shot at at, at rip um, so i went in and i said hey i know what games you recruiters play okay <laughs> like i want to be a ranger and that's it and if you don't have that for me i'm gonna leave and um the recruiter was like I'll get you a ranger spot. No problem. <laughs> He's like, I'm not going to play games. Like, do you know what's going on out there? Yeah, we'll get you an option 40. I didn't realize that, op- that, a, that a ranger contract was a great way for them to source just regular. Inf- anyone who quit became a regular infantryman. So, so that, was, that was one benefit, I guess, is that mm-hmm. if, if I hadn't passed, and I had this in the back of my mind, that if I didn't pass, past rip and i got sent to a conventional unit well at least i'd be an infantryman at right. least i'd still get to see what this war was about as opposed to like becoming like a laundry specialist no offense to laundry <laughs> specialists, but that wasn't that wasn't the experience i was looking for i on the other hand had the opposite if i had quit seal training i was going to be swabbing a deck of a shift and that was some motivating stuff right there anyway didn't so um yeah. So, so tell me, I mean, your recruiter, I mean, you, did you go to the recruiter by yourself? Yeah. Did you, yeah, you did. I mean, yeah. and you just said, Hey, I want to do this dive fair. Is that what you called it? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I had talked. Yeah. We had a Navy recruiter come into our high school prior to this and, you know, give one of those spiels, see the world, it's not just a job. It's a great, it's an adventure, <laughs> all that. And um, I thought, yeah, it is kind of cool. I mean, just the thought of traveling around the world, but the thought of being on the ship was nauseating to me. I, I was like, I do not want to do that. And I don't like those, what I thought were silly hats that they had to wear the upside down dog dish. Um, right. I, did, I thought their uniforms sucked. I was like, ah, that's just not the, un- I mean, I want to dress blues or something like the Marines have. Right. Those right. look cool. But uh, yeah, no, he came in and I talked to him, but it was at high school, but I didn't really, I talked to one Marine recruiter and yeah, he tried to give me this thing where uh, the greatest thing in the world was being an infantry Marine. <laughs> and uh, I was like, uh, I don't know that that's my calling. I was like, isn't there something like force recon? And he goes, yeah, but you don't want to do that and blah, blah, blah. And this is back before. That's another thing too, because you, you, Patrick are a part of the, I don't know how many times I've heard guys in your generation say, man, nine 11 did it. That was it. There was no looking back. It was a whole generation of people out there that they, those twin towers lit a serious fire under a lot of people. 
And, but um, I was I was coming in in an incredibly long stretch of peace, relatively speaking. Um, Vietnam ended in 75 officially. And we didn't have really much at all for a long time. Few flashes here and there, Grenada, which was was not that big a deal, really. I mean, um, and um, I can't, the Achille Lauro hijacking a, a ship um, and SEAL Team 6 actually boarded that one um, back in the 80s, late 80s. I was, I was into my high school. But really, there was nothing else. And, and there was, so there was also a whole kind of half generation of SEALs and special operators who had not seen combat. I mean, you'd have to have, you either had a Vietnam medal, which means you had a combat action ribbon, or hardly anybody else had a combat action ribbon, which mm -hmm. is weird when you have instructors putting you through training who'd never even seen combat. And there was this weirdness about when we went to the Gulf War, how we were, like you said, we wanted to go. We were dying to go. In fact, we were the, I was one of the first two platoons to land in Saudi Arabia in desert shield which became desert storm and i remember being so excited i'm like how lucky could i possibly be to be on this bird going over there and um and everybody else is jealous all the other seals right. anyway right. were like yeah men made a deal with the devil or something so yeah there was that but um different generations but also different time periods of posture toward combat it was once i mean i remember it's like one of those things that everybody my parents say they they'll never forget where they were when kennedy was shot and um for for us it's i'll never forget where i was when the planes hit the towers and um um boy what a and it's it's really dramatic too how ch the world changed in so many ways right the pre 9-11 world and the post 9-11 world with yeah, i mean you could go off in all kinds of directions and now with what's going on in ukraine which we haven't even commented on um I, just this morning just this morning i was at a an ash wednesday service at my local church and these these sirens go off i mean blaring sirens like you know i don't know tornado warning sirens and I, i'm like right. is it wednesday at 12 o'clock well, it's Wednesday, but it was like nine in the morning. And I'm like, and it kept going off. It wasn't just like that. And, and it, it ramped up and ramped down and ramped up. And then my phone buzzes. And I'm like, oh, oh no, man. Are the Sylvia, have the Sylvia's launched nukes? Like, that's <laughs> the first thing that pops in my mind. Of course, it was a National Weather Service. Caller. National Weather Service issue um, doing a test, but uh, it, it it scared the crap out of me at first. And it was one of those, my heart, it was one of those sinking feelings, but anyway. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, it's pretty wild. Um, we'll, fi we'll figure out how to, how to, how to broach that subject. Uh, again, I don't, I don't know. We'll, yeah. Maybe we'll review a book. We'll talk about that later. Um, so let's cut it here. Let's pause. This is a good stopping point. We've talked about leading up to, to, to the both of us joining. Uh, I've got in mind the, the perfect recruiting into basic training story, I think, to kick us off. It involves Preparation H. So I think we'll leave them hanging with that. <laughs> and awesome. uh, and uh, we'll be back. We'll be back next time. So uh, thank you all, and we'll see you next time.